Well, all right. Um, if I'm a little high strung today, I blame uh, Pastor Paul, because there at the beginning he said, if you haven't already got a cup of coffee, if you want another one, go get one, and I did, and I drank it during worship, so as if I needed any more energy, I am ready to go, but uh, it's just good to be hanging out with everyone today. I love, I love getting together to do this, um, if you're here on site with us or if you're uh, joining us online. I love that we can gather together in whatever capacity that is. We're going to jump right into things, shall we? Uh, Last week, we started a new series called Aftermath, and we are talking about what happened in the aftermath of the resurrection, uh, the event that launched Christianity, that the whole thing is built upon. Uh, It turned the world upside down, and the Jesus movement, what became known as the church, sprang out of that. And so we're looking at those early days and, and trying to figure out, as we try to navigate following Jesus in the 21st century, what did it look like for those in the first century, and what can we learn from them? And to do that, we've been uh, looking through a, a document document called Acts, and it was written by a guy named Luke. Uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. It's an account of the life of Jesus, and he also wrote this book called Acts that kind of records about the first 30 years uh, after the resurrection as the church is getting launched off the ground and things are getting going. And so last week, we, uh, we discovered that for the earliest followers of Jesus, the thing that was the foundation of their faith, that their, that their, of their hope, of their boldness, the thing that caused all of their fears to melt away, that allowed them to just go out and proclaim the message of Jesus, was something that happened. It was this singular event of the resurrection, that they had all witnessed their leader, their teacher, their friend be crucified, and then they saw him alive again, and when that happened, Like their lives changed and the world changed. And so we looked at that uh, and the message of Jesus went out and people started following Jesus like crazy. Thousands upon thousands of people in and around the area of Jerusalem start becoming followers of Jesus. But in those early days, uh, the, the church, Christianity, the Jesus movement maintained a very still distinctly Jewish kind of flavor or posture. Um, And that's understandable because the earliest followers of Jesus, the first disciples, the apostles, They were all Jewish. Jesus himself was Jewish. He came as the fulfillment of the the Jewish scriptures, what would be called the law and the prophets. Uh, That Jesus is, is the Messiah that was predicted by them. And all of the events of the early church happen in and around the area of Jerusalem and Judea. And so it makes sense that it's it's still a very Jewish thing. Um, but that was that fact almost derailed the movement or, or stopped the movement from going forward. For the earliest followers of Jesus, they, they were having a hard time breaking from thinking as Jewish people and embracing thinking as Jesus people. Uh, they, they were trying to hold both of them at the same time. What they knew growing up and what uh, their, their scripture had taught and now what Jesus had co- uh, come to reveal. They had this, this issue of uh, mixing and matching and blending covenants. And a covenant is a kind of a, a fancy word for like a, 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 an agreement, or an arrangement between two parties. Uh, and so we have the Old Covenant, and that's what we would consider kind of the Old Testament. But the whole Old Testament isn't the Old Covenant, but it's a large portion of it. Uh, the Old Covenant would be found from like Exodus through Malachi. So Exodus, we, we see God rescuing the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and he establishes them, say, hey, I'm your God, you're my people, I'm going to use you. Um, and, and then he gives them the terms of that relationship. Like, since you are my people, here's how you are to live and to relate to one another and relate to the world around you. Here's the law by which you live, and that's the Old Covenant. Then as we read the Old Testament, we see the history of that nation playing out as they try to be that covenant people, and most of the time, they don't do a very great job of it. And so then we run into the prophets of the Old Testament whose primary function is to speak on behalf of God to those people and call them back to faithfulness to the covenant and call them back uh, to God. And so the earliest followers of Jesus, that's their heritage. That's what they're, what they're like attached to. So you have that old covenant between the nation of Israel and then the new thing that Jesus did. That he said, I've, I've come to, to bring about and to start a new covenant. And the new covenant through Jesus was for everyone. The old covenant was for a particular group of people at a particular time. It was the nation of Israel at that point and that time in history. But it was always to be a means to an end that it always ultimately led to Jesus and God doing something for the entire world. And so there's this tension in the early church of these Jewish followers of Jesus, like we have our old covenant, but then there's this new thing that Jesus did, and and instead of fully stepping into the new, sometimes they had a tendency to grab some of the old and try to take some of the new and mix it together, throw it in a blender, and it didn't turn out well. 
And I think sometimes today we still wrestle with that same issue. Now, eventually, the early church, that they broke away from that thinking, uh, and we're going to look at that a little bit and what we can learn from that. So picking up the storyline where we left off last week, you know, we kind of left off with, uh, specifically, it was Peter uh, proclaiming this message of, of Jesus in, in and around the area of Jerusalem, and all these people start becoming followers of Jesus. There's thousands upon thousands of Jesus followers, and the movement is growing like crazy, and as a, kind of a result of that growth and the animosity of the Jewish religious leaders towards the early Christians, persecution breaks out against the earliest followers of Jesus. Uh, persecution breaks out against followers of the way. In the early days, they weren't called Christians. People just referred to them as the way. If you uh, open up your Bibles to Acts and you're reading and, and you'll see like the way and it's, in, like, it's like capitalized, it's talking about like the way of Jesus, these followers of the way. The persecution breaks out against them and Luke highlights for us, and he kind of puts front and center of like the ringleader or the leader of that persecution, uh, like the person he wants to put front and center as the one who is uh, like the driving force behind the persecution was a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was a, a, was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. Um, he actually becomes known as the Apostle Paul, which uh, maybe we're more familiar uh, with him by, by that name. But Saul of Tarsus, he's a Jewish religious leader, and he's a really, really good one. As we kind of learn more about his life and read some of his letters, he wrote about half of the New Testament, we, we discover that he was like the best of the best when it comes to Pharisees. Uh, he was passionate and zealous and expert in the law. His whole job was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the law really, really well and try to get other people to keep the law too. Uh, he had great education and was connected to you know, powerful people. That is Saul of Tarsus. And he, he understood in these early days when he is persecuting the church, he understands that Christianity, or the way as it was known then, was incompatible. It was a threat to Judaism. Now, it wasn't a threat in terms of the way that we might think of threat as like, like the Christians are going to go and they're going to wipe out Judaism and there's going to be like violence or force because that's not how the early church or how Christians operated. Um, but, but he understood that the two don't go well together, that, that some of the core message of, of, of the Christian faith and the message that Jesus is the Messiah and he's been raised from the dead, he understood that that would undermine his Judaism. And so Saul of Tarsus makes it his like life's work and his own personal personal mission to put an end to the church, to single-handedly say, I'm going to wipe it off the face of the planet. And he goes around rounding up followers of Jesus and imprisoning them. And we're going to kind of pick up his story about three to five years after the resurrection. So this is three to five years into the church going, and it's growing, and people are coming to faith in Jesus. Uh, and Saul sets out to round up more and impris imprison some Jesus followers. So this is Acts chapter 9, if you'd like to follow along, or the words are going to be on our screens as well. So Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1, says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he's, Luke's like, meanwhile, Saul is still doing this, because Luke actually introduced us to Saul two chapters before this. There is an event that happens where one of the disciples named Stephen is stoned to death, and Luke just kind of makes this little note that Saul was standing there, and he was like approving of what happened. It's like this ominous foreshadowing, and then two chapters later, Luke's like, oh yes, remember Saul? He's still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And so he went to the high priest. Uh, that, that was like the guy who was in charge of uh, Judaism. Uh, he was like the point person. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so Saul goes to the high priest and says, hey, I want you to like deputize me because it's not enough for me to just round up these Jesus followers in Jerusalem. This thing is spreading. You've got to give me permission to go to all the surrounding areas and do whatever it takes to bring back those Christians and, and we will take care of them. We will imprison them. We will punish them. And Paul is, is breathing out murderous threats. He's using violence. He's using force. He's using coercion. By any means, means necessary, Paul wants to go and do this. And notice, because something happens here that, that sometimes we don't think is very significant, but it's huge. Notice that Saul has no problem using violence to do what he considers to be the will of God. Saul has no issue of conscience. He's not like, oh, that's probably not right for me to do. He is absolutely fine with that because of what he had read and known from his scriptures, from his old covenant. 
he had read about the warrior that King David is and defeating the enemies of Israel. He'd read about conquest. He'd read about Israel going to war and defeating the enemies of Israel and God. And so in his mind, he's going, well, the new enemy are these followers of the way. And he has no problem using violence to get rid of them. So he's like, I'm on a mission. I'm going up north to a place called Damascus, and I'm going to round them all up. While he's on his way to Damascus, he has an encounter with the risen Jesus. Um, and he, his life is radically transformed. He sees this blinding light. He gets knocked off his horse. If you've ever heard phrases like, I had a Damascus Road experience, or I've been blinded by the light. If you have the song stuck in your head the rest of your day, you're welcome for that. Um, but but like that, those all come from this experience that, that Saul has on this road to Damascus. He has an encounter with the risen Jesus. He's blinded for a few days. He hears this voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you? He's like, I'm Jesus. And he gets instruction to continue on to Damascus and wait there because a man named Ananias is going to come and lay hands on him and pray for him and he's going to receive some instruction. And so at the same time, God gives this message to this other man, Ananias. He says, hey, go find Saul of Tarsus. I want you to lay hands on him so he can receive his sight. You're going to pray for him. And I love Ananias' response because it's not, it's not like, sure, God, whatever you say, I'm excited to go and do whatever you tell me. He's, he's pretty apprehensive. We see how he responds in verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. It's like, yeah, I know who Saul of Tarsus is. He's got a reputation. Like, he, he's, a, he's violent. He's throwing us in prison. He's like, I know who this guy is. And not only have I heard about what he's done in Jerusalem, but he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all of us who call on your name. But God has a different plan. As the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. Ananias, I see something that you don't. I'm actually going to use Saul. I'm going to take all that passion and all that zeal and all that energy that he has towards you know, wiping out the church. I'm going to redirect that, and he's going to be the biggest proclaimer of the message of Jesus and the best church planner that the world has ever seen. He's going to use that, all that intimate knowledge that Saul had of the old covenant, and he's going to be able to use that to teach people and use that as backstory. Ananias, trust me, I've got a plan. And so that's exactly what happens to Saul. He, he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. He proclaims the message of Jesus all around the Roman Empire, he, and he starts these little Jesus gatherings. He writes all these letters to them that make up about half of our New Testament. He takes on then the name Paul. He had two names. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. He was a Roman citizen, so as he goes to these Gentile areas, he leverages his Roman citizenship, and he becomes known as the apostle Paul. But with something extraordinary happens in Paul's life. In this moment when he gets his, his sight back, you know, he, his, his physical sight is restored, but more than that, he gains spiritual insight. Like his eyes are opened up and he gets clarity as it relates to who Jesus is and what relationship the new covenant that Jesus has established now, now has on the old covenant that Paul had grown up with that he was an expert in. And he begins to understand that the two are incompatible that they don't play well together, that you can't hold both and say, I'm going to do both of these at the same time. It doesn't work. He understands that they were incompatible in more than just terms of salvation because if you've grown up around church, maybe you've heard uh, the Old Covenant talked about, the Old Testament talked about you're being saved by works and the new is you're being saved by grace or you're being saved by faith. That's actually not the case. Paul comes along in his letters and fleshes that out and says, no, no, we've always been saved by faith. The, the Jewish people didn't think they were saved by works. God said, hey, you're my people. I've called you, I've chosen you, you didn't deserve that. Now, here is how you live as my people. It was never live as my people, so, or live this way so that you will be my people. Uh, the Jewish people actually thought they were God's chosen people, not by works, but by birth. We're, we're the Jewish nation, we're the, the nation of Israel. God has chosen us. But Paul comes along and understands that it's not just a salvation thing, it is a, a whole of life, like how you relate to God and the world around you and how you see things and what you build your life on. The old covenant and the new you, you can't hold on to both of them at the same time. And he instantly, and this is, this is crazy, this is why I mentioned him using violence to do the will of God before. He instantly goes from a man who, who was a, a religious you know, inquisitor, like he was fine with leveraging violence to do the will of God. He goes from that to never using violence again. 
Like there, there's never any instance, let alone using violence in the name of God, but he, there's never any indication that Paul ever uses any kind of retaliation uh, or violence, and he would have had plenty of opportunities to do so over the things that he had experienced. And he actually becomes the person that brings us some of the most beautiful literature on the nature of self-sacrificial love because he understood that God had done a new thing. And he proclaims that message to the world. He went from, like Paul's mission was like, I'm here to purge my nation of this blight of the way, purge the nation to, no, no, I now want to reach the nations with this message of Jesus. He lets go of the temporary and conditional arrangement and covenant that God had with Israel so that he could embrace the permanent new covenant through Jesus that God had established for the entire world. And he would go on to, again, carry the message of Jesus all around the Roman Empire. And we're gonna come back to Paul's story a little bit later uh, and more so next week. Uh, But while that's going on with Paul, the other apostles, the other disciples, they're still back in the area of Jerusalem. Uh, Peter that we talked about last week and all the other guys, they're they're, kind of hanging around the area of Jerusalem and Judea and they're still having this problem too of holding on to the new that Jesus has unleashed on the world and the the old covenant. They're still like, what do we do? How do we do this? And they're wrestling with this. And, And sometimes I don't think we realize how much it took for them to wrestle with this because we just turned the page. We're reading in Acts, Acts chapter 9, we read about Paul's conversion experience, we turn the page, it's Acts chapter 10, and this encounter that we're going to look at with Peter, we're like, oh, it's just a page later. But between like Acts 9, Paul's experience, and about Acts 10, what happens with Peter, that's five years that pass in between there. What we're going to look at that happens with Peter was about 10 to 12 years after the resurrection. So that's been a decade. Jesus has said, hey, you're going to be my witnesses. Go spread this message. And the church is growing. And a decade later, Peter and the other disciples, they're still like, what do we do with our old, like our old covenant? What do we do with the new? How do we make those things work together? Maybe we can try to do a little of both. And God arranges an intervention with Peter. Peter's on the roof of a house in a place called Joppa. And uh, he's up on the roof, it's almost lunchtime, he falls asleep for a little nap, and he has this vision. Like, he has a dream, and in this dream, this happens three different times, he sees all of these animals that for, for Peter, as a Jewish man, they were forbidden for him. Like, you don't touch those things, you definitely don't eat those things, because they are, they are unclean, and they will make you unclean. So Peter's whole life, he's like, I'm not touching, not eating those animals, I'm staying away from those particular animals. And in this vision, he, he sees all these unclean animals, and he hears a voice that turns out to be the voice of God, and says, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. In other words, Peter, it's lunchtime, you're hungry, dinner is served right? And, and I would, if, if I'm Peter, I'm saying amen and hallelujah, because one of the animals that was unclean for the Jewish people are pigs, and y'all know how I feel about barbecue, okay? Like, I'm just like, whoa, this is awesome. Thank you, Jesus, the gift that is pulled pork, okay? It, yes, of all the things I get a clap and an amen for in our church, it's pulled pork, okay? I see how we do things here, but, but that's not Peter's initial thought, because you know, for me, that's exciting, and that's fun, but I'm not hardwired to the old covenant in the way that Peter was. See, for him, it wasn't like, yes, this is awesome. For him, this is a deep internal struggle. In fact, the way he responds is is somewhat shocking. As he has this dream, here's the response that he has. He says, surely not, Lord. Surely not. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now, this is Peter, and he's like, he's like talking back to Jesus, the Jesus who he had spent time with, that he had seen risen from the dead, that he's proclaiming this message, and when Jesus is like, hey, Peter, here's something that I'm telling you, he's like, no, no, and it's almost like he doesn't have to think about it, that just comes out of him because it's hardwired into him, but he's, he's gently corrected in verse 15, it says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Peter's going to be like, wait, 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 my my whole life, my whole life, this has been off limits. And now you're saying it's not. What what, what do I do with that? And I would imagine that that creates a bit of a crisis in Peter. And sometimes there's this crisis in us too because we we go, okay, I, I read the Old Testament, I read the New Testament. Did God change? Did God change his mind? Is is it a different God? And the answer is no. In fact, that was one of the earliest heresies in the church. It was called Marcionism that, that saw that, that said the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. It's the same God. 
It's not that God changed his mind or his character changed. In fact, if you read, if you read how patient and loving and faithful God is to the nation of Israel, it's like, that's just, that's the way of Jesus all over it, of like, I'm, I'm gonna be faithful to you. I love you. I'm forgiving you. I'm calling you to myself. It's not that God changed his mind or his character. He changed covenants. It was the way that he was working and relating in the world. The old served a purpose. It was, hey, nation of Israel, I'm calling you, and I'm going to use you to do something for the whole world. And now that something for the whole world had come to fulfillment in the person of Jesus. The old was done. The new was here. And so as that vision happens and Peter wakes up, he hears a pound on the door down below, and there's some men there that are looking for him. They were sent there by uh, a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius, um, he, he's a Gentile, not, not Jewish by birth, and, and not only is he a Gentile, but he's like, he works for like Rome, the, kind of the enemy of the Jewish people. But he, he's mentioned as a God-fearer, so that's like a Gentile who in some way or another, to some degree, is interested in or is, is somewhat following the God of the Hebrews. But Cornelius sends men to Peter because they're like, okay, we, we want to know more about God. We want to know more about this Jesus thing. So he sends some guys, go get Peter, bring Peter back here because certainly he can explain everything to us. So these men show up and they say, hey, Peter, will you come with us? Peter goes with them. Peter takes a couple of his friends and they, they, they journey to um, Cornelius' house. And when they get there, Cornelius has like, he's got all his friends and family there. It's a packed, I mean, you can imagine, like, hey, Pe- like the Peter is coming. Yeah, Peter who is with Jesus, he's coming. So go tell everybody. And so there's this packed house, and Peter goes inside um, and, and says something astounding. Verse 27, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And what he says is, is really quite offensive but he's just letting them know, hey, here's where I was. This is me on my journey. This is just me processing out loud. He says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. He says, guys, you, you know this because it wasn't a secret. The Gentile people knew, hey, the Jewish people, they don't like us. They don't come to our houses. They don't eat our food. You know, we don't, they cross the street when they see us coming, like that whole thing. Like we, they, they, they don't like us at all. Peter says, you know, it's against our law. And not the law of the land, not the, like the, the law of Rome, but against the law of the Jewish people. And then, you know, he kind of says, but, but I've changed my mind on that. But in saying that he's changed his mind on it, he almost says something even more offensive. He says, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. God's shown me this. Now, it's been 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus, and this whole time I thought all of you were impure and unclean, but he's shown me that, that I was wrong. It's like, okay, Peter, thank you for admitting that, I think. Like, ouch, that kind of hurts. But Peter, he's processing this of like, something's changing. He's like, yeah, I thought all of you were impure and unclean. And Peter could have said, and I could go to my scriptures to back it up. He could go to passages in what we would call the Old Testament, but the Old Covenant that says, hey, you know, nation of Israel, you are to be separate You don't associate with the foreign nations. You know, you don't enter into relationships and agreements with them. You don't go into their houses. He could have said, like, here's why I believed this. Here's why I believe this. But Peter, it's it's beginning to to kind of break through in his thinking of like, well, something different is happening here. So he's in the house. He's like, well, I'm here. I might as well start telling him about Jesus. Verse 34, Peter began to speak, and he said, I now realize How true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Peter's like, I realize now God doesn't play favorites. He he, he accepts everyone from every nation. Like, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your family story is, what your personal story is, what what, what language you speak, your culture. It doesn't matter, like, your your religious background, your, your socioeconomic. Look, 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 look. It doesn't matter. He says God accepts everyone. The invitation is to everyone who fears him and does what is right. That is, it's the idea of, of, of fear, like scriptural fear. It's not like, ah, oh, I'm afraid of snakes. It's like, it's awe, it's reverence. It's my eyes are open to see God for who he really is. I'm seeing Jesus for who he really is and does what is right. He's like, okay, I'm following him. I'm following him with my whole life. Peter says, look, the invitation is for everyone who says, Jesus, I see you, I'm following you. And God says, great, welcome to the family. He's like, I realize God doesn't show favoritism, and, and we want to yes and amen that, and we should. And we're like, yeah, because God doesn't play favorites. He loves everybody. But what I want us to know and understand, which was hard for them to grasp, is that is not in the whole of what we would now call the Bible. That is a new covenant idea. Because in the old covenant, God had favorites. God, he was the king of the whole universe, but 
He favored the Jewish people. They were his chosen people to accomplish something in the world. The old was a means to a new, and now Peter sees, ah, the new is here. So Peter starts telling the story of Jesus. He just kind of hits the, the, the Cliff Notes version. He hits the highlights, and he starts with uh, um, Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and he kind of runs through that, and then he gets to like the crescendo. He's like, here's the most important part of my message. Verse 39, he says, and we are witnesses, talking about him and the guys that were there with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and they killed him by hanging him on a cross. And if you were here with us or tuned in last week, you probably know what Peter's going to say next. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. And Peter would look at these people and say, and I, I, I'd seen him, and I'd seen him over and over again. It caused him to be seen, and he was, he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Listen to this, he says, all the prophets testify about him. And so Peter's going, look, I'm not throwing out my scriptures. I'm not throwing out what we would call the Old Testament. He's saying, no, 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 here's the beauty of it. All of our prophets, they were pointing to Jesus. Everything in the law and the prophets, it was, it, it was always about him. It's all about him, and we're, we're getting to him. He's like, and now he is here. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And then, the same thing, this is, this is insane, the same thing that happened to Peter and the other disciples a decade before happens to these Gentiles. The Holy Spirit of God falls on them and fills them. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers, that's their way of of referring to the the Jewish uh, Christians, uh, because circumcision was the sign of the old covenant between the Jewish men uh, and God. And so that's a shorthand saying, hey, the circumcised believers is, is all these followers of Jesus that were Jewish that had embraced the old covenant. It says, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. And so as they're seeing this happening, they're going, no way. No way is this happening. We can't possibly grasp this. I mean, they're thinking 10 years prior, and it's like, well, I mean, that was a big deal when God's Spirit came on us. Like, that was a really big deal, and we, we were blown away then, but are you kidding me that the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, like, is, is coming to live and to dwell within. Like, that, that's what happens when you start following Jesus. God's indwelling presence comes to live within you, and, and they're seeing this, and like, there's no way that God would be that close, that he would be that close with, with a Gentile. Like, there, there's no way that God would, would commune that way and be as close as, as, as God can possibly be to skin and bones. There's no way he would do that to the Gentiles because for them, they're like, our whole lives, the Gentiles are unclean, the Gentiles are unclean, and now God is taking up residence in them? And it says they're astonished. They can't believe this. And we're like, oh, that, seems, oh, that seems really narrow-minded. That seems really discriminatory of like, no, Gentiles, God can't love you. You can't experience his presence. But it was a different world for them. Because to the, to the people that were there closest to the action, to the ones that were there when the thing began, they understood the old covenant in a way that maybe we never will. They, they understood what it meant to be people of the old covenant, to be God's nation, to be the nation of Israel and the purpose that they serve in the world in a way that, that we just won't. And they, they're like, I don't understand. I'm astonished. How can God's presence come to live and to dwell within Gentiles? I mean, in the, in the, old, in the old Testament, the old covenant, God was still working in the world, absolutely. But he was doing it through Israel. And he drew a circle around them and said, hey, you're my people. You don't associate with, with the Gentile nations. Like, don't let them in. You, you don't marry, you don't intermarry, you, know, you don't marry their women, you don't marry your women off to them, like, you don't, you don't invite them over to your house for dinner. You are my separate, chosen, set apart, and you, you, you keep yourself separate. And now Peter and, and, and the guys with him are like, oh my gosh, it's, ha- it's happening. Like, God is doing something for the whole world, and we're witnessing it with our very eyes.
And so they stay with um, Cornelius and his family for a little while. They, they baptize people, they teach them, and then they go on their way. But word about this event gets around. This isn't just like, a, oh, something happened one day. It's like, no, like, especially the, the Jewish followers of Jesus, they're all like, did you hear? Did you hear what happened? And many of them are not so thrilled with what Peter did. We turn the page to chapter 11. It says, The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, there they are again, the circumcised believers criticized him. And they said to him, You went into the house of uncircumcised men? You, you went into Gentiles, a Gentile's house and there were all these Gentile people around? How could you? And it gets worse than that. Not only that, but you ate with them. You broke bread with them. You, like, you sat down at a table with them, which was a, a deep sign of association and intimacy in the ancient world. Just like, like we are together. There's a closeness. There's a communal thing. Peter, you did that with Gentiles? It's like, Peter, dude, you, that's disgusting. You are a terrible Jewish man. You're a terrible Jewish Christian. Peter, how could you do that? How could you? And we're like, what's up with these people? How could they be so closed-minded? But again, they, they understood that the, the, the old covenant in a way that we don't. And they began to see the incompatibility of the two of, hey, there was nothing wrong with the old that it was perfect, it did what it was designed to do, and it worked in the world in a way that was appropriate for that time and place, but it was always meant to get us to the new thing that Jesus was doing that we get to be welcomed into. And they eventually broke away from that, of that mixing and matching and that blending together, but sometimes I think we have a tendency because maybe we're not as familiar with the old to still do the same thing and try to mash them up together. And they knew that they couldn't. And eventually they broke from it. We'll pick that up a little bit more last week, but, but here's kind of, or we're going to pick it up last week. How does that happen? I just built myself a time machine like that. We'll pick that up a little bit more next week. But here's what happened um, after that. The, the persecution continues against the followers of the way. And it, it actually serves as, as, um, as a catalyst for the message to go out because as the followers of Jesus are persecuted in and around Jerusalem and Judea, they scatter and they carry the message of Jesus into all different parts of the world. One of the areas they go is way up north, like 300 miles north um, to the city of Antioch, which was a Greco-Roman city. So Greek culture, Roman culture, uh, Gentile people, you know, pagan people worshiping all the various pagan deities, not followers of Judaism or Jesus. Now there were some Jews in the city there, there were some synagogues, but by large majority, this is a Gentile region, Gentile city, and so they, some of them flee to Antioch, and they start telling all these Gentile people, hey, we've got this great news about Jesus. God has done something for the whole world. Do you want in on this? And the Gentile people are like, yes, we want in on this. And all these people start coming to faith. They're leaving behind you know, the, 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 the temple worship of Zeus and whoever else, because I'm not that up to date on my Greco-Roman gods anymore. I did take Latin, but I forgot most of it. So anyway, they're, they're, they're like, oh, yes, we're coming to faith, and it's, it's great. And so many people are coming to faith actually that they have to send back to the church in Jerusalem for reinforcements. So, like we need help discipling all these people because there's so many people coming to faith. So the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas up there um, to kind of to, to take charge. And the, the growth continues to explode and Barnabas is like, okay, got to call in reinforcements. It's time to bring out the heavy hitter. And so verse 25 says, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. That, that title Christian was given to the followers of Jesus, not initially chosen by them. It was kind of a, a bit of an insult of like, oh, isn't that cute? You bunch of little, you're little Christ, little Christ is, is basically what it means. And they ended up embracing it. But for a year, Saul or Paul and, and Barnabas, they teach, and all of these, these non-Jewish people start becoming followers of Jesus. And it would lead to a, a culminating, uh, just pivotal moment uh, in the history of the church uh, which is why we're actually here today, and we're going to pick that up next week. But as we kind of wrap things up, maybe you're asking the question, that's great, but what does that have to do with any of us? It was interesting, a little run-through of, of early church history, but like, what does that have to do with us? Aren't we past all of that? 
Aren't we past that whole old and new mixing that together? Aren't we past, you know, none of us, you know, none of us are, are Jewish by heritage. I don't think so. So we don't have that old covenant thing going on. Like, aren't we, aren't we past that? And yeah, not really. We still have a tendency because of Sometimes, man, just because of the way that this was presented to us, the way that this was handed to us, because of the way like devotional b- books work, it's like, hey, here's one verse for today, void of any context, uh, because of song lyrics and different things, we still have a tendency to, to cherry pick the old covenant and say, how can I fit that nicely um, in with uh, Jesus? And that, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And when we, when we blend the two together, Christians and the church, and then by association, Jesus end up catching a really bad rap. It makes the message of Jesus very resistible because it's like, well, I like these parts. Yeah, but what about all this other stuff? And why are you behaving that way? It doesn't seem to mesh up with Jesus. And it's because we do this blending thing. I want to give us a couple of examples as we close out um, because I think it's helpful to see like how this creeps in. And so just a couple of things of where we see old covenant, new covenant thinking today. You know, in the news a lot lately, um, or if you're kind of, plugged into either Christian culture or just regular culture, there's a lot of talk of Christian nationalism. Like Christian nationalism is I'm taking a national identity and I'm, I'm mashing that together with Jesus and it's like this, you know, God and country, God loves our country best kind of thing and we will fight and you can't separate the two. Jesus would outright rebuke that. Jesus is, is not for one nation or another, but that's the old covenant kind of thinking because it's I take Jesus, I take the cross, I take his love and his grace, and then, well, in the Old Covenant, God loves a specific nation the most. And so that's God's nation and God's people. And we identify and adopt that and say, hey, we're God's special nation and God's special people. But that's not the New Covenant. New Covenant is not, Jesus said, I'm not concerned about a nation. I'm, I'm here about a kingdom. And my kingdom includes every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And your citizenship, if you're a follower of Jesus, is not in whatever country you live in. It is in the kingdom of God. As we blend those two things together, sometimes we see the old and the new blending together with this thing called the prosperity gospel. It takes Jesus and the cross and his blood and his sacrifice says, thank you, God, thank you so much for that. Uh, and, and, but then it takes that and says, if you have enough faith in Jesus, well, then you're gonna have material wealth and physical blessings and you'll be healthy and you'll be wealthy and, and there's, you don't find that anywhere in the new covenant, nowhere in the new testament. But if you go back to the old, and God's arrangement with Israel, which was tied to a chunk of land, the promised land. And God said, Look, if you'll follow me, if you'll obey me, if you'll do what I've said, then I'm going to bless your land. And your crops will be plentiful. And, and your wives will bear you many children. And it'll be a land flowing with milk and honey. And all of that will happen. And you'll have new wine. And it'll be overflowing. And we, we go, oh, I like the sound of that. Let me tack that on to Jesus but it's blending the old and the new. We see the old and new blended together whenever uh, we will pull verses out of context and go, you know, hey, if my people who are called by my name will turn their faces to me and turn away from their sin, I will heal their land. I'll hear them when they pray. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. That's an, again, that's another land promise to Israel. Israel, if you turn back to me, I will restore your land. God's not in the business of just blessing certain lands. Again, the land doesn't matter. And here, here's something. There's a principle in that, yes, we should turn to God. Yes, we should pray. Yes, he he- hears us. Amen, that's amazing. But all of God's people in a particular nation, like all the church may turn to him and may pray and the land may not get any better because God's not in it for, it's not, it's not a land, it's not a place, it's, it's the kingdom, it's worldwide. We blend the two together. We blend the two together when, when we see the thing that the Apostle Paul turned away from. When we use violence, we leverage violence in the name of God or we're just, we just celebrate violence in, in general and we say, well, you know, the ends justify the mean. That's not how, how the kingdom of God works. But we take a little bit of the old and say, well, David was a warrior, and what about the conquest? What about all these other things? And I can tack that onto Jesus, but Jesus comes along and says, wait, wait, wait. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Pick up your cross. Put down your sword. And Paul, Paul's like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the violence. But we, we mash those two things together. We, we mix them together whenever we, this one drives me crazy, when Christians judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians. I'm like, wait a minute. They're, they don't follow Jesus. Why would they live like they do? But like, if you've ever heard like Christians railing, oh, culture's so bad, it's going to hell in a handbasket, and God's going to get them, and like, yeah, like judgment, condemnation. It's like, wait, 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 that's old covenant thinking because that's what the Old Testament prophets did because their job was, hey, we're speaking on behalf of God to the nation of Israel and saying, you need to turn back to God. You need to, but they, they weren't broadcasting that to everyone. It was to God's covenant people. The Apostle Paul actually even writes about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? 
It's none of my business. It says, you're to judge those inside the church. That, that in other words, hey, if you're following Jesus, we do have a responsibility to hold one another accountable and say, hey, you claim to follow Jesus, right? We got, that, that, that ain't Jesus-y. Like, we, we got to call each other out on that, but it's none of our business. It's not our job to be the moral police for the world. We see old covenant, new covenant blended together. This is the last one, I promise. This is almost just a list of things that drive me crazy. I'm sorry. Like sometimes we see like the fighting for, for one of the things of like, oh, we, we need like the Ten Commandments on, court, on the courthouse walls or on our national monuments. We've got to have the Ten Commandments. It's like, why? And, and first of all, that's like that whole Christian nationalism thing creeping in. And then but just because like, well, God's the lawgiver. I'm like, okay, I agree with that. God does give us the law. But the Ten Commandments are like the introduction. They're like the table of contents for the 613 Old Covenant laws. Why those ten and not the rest? Why cherry pick? And, and if we're followers of Jesus, wouldn't, wouldn't it, why aren't we fighting? If we want to have something posted somewhere, why not, hey, I want the Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus displayed somewhere. Well, why, why not, hey, um, you know, love your enemies, forgive people. Like, why, why don't we want that? We're like, no, I want the Ten Commandments. I want thou shalt not murder. Like, okay, yeah, I agree with that. That's a good law. We shouldn't murder. In fact, we have that law. <laughs> we don't need to post it again. But, but, but why not the words of Jesus? Because Jesus actually comes along, and when he says, I'm here to fulfill the old covenant, the, the old prophet, the, the, the law and the prophets, he raises the bar. He says, you've heard it said don't murder. I tell you, don't even be angry. Like, don't hold a grudge. Don't harbor hate in your heart because that's actually what leads to, to murder. You've already murdered that person in your heart. Why, why not the words of Jesus? Why do we do this thing where we mash it up and say, I want to fight for that and fight for that? And It happens when we blend the two together. And, and look, that's not like, hey, we're all terrible, we're bad. But I, just, I want us to see it. I want us, like, when we're out and about in our lives to go, oh, I, I, I see it happening in myself. I see it happening in someone else. Let me course correct a little bit. And I understand how it happened, right? Because a lot of it happened because of, of how we've been taught to handle this. Because many of us, if we, if we grew up in the church, or even if you came to church, like, later in faith, at some point, someone probably gave you a Bible and said, hey, this is God's word. Read it and do it. I'm here to say, uh, with an asterisk, or asterisk, or however you say that. I'm here to say, yeah, this is God's word. Don't do all of it. Because if you do some of the stuff in here, you're going to go to jail, okay? Specifically the stuff that's in the Old Covenant. Like, there's some of these things. Like, it's, what nobody said was, hey, this is the written word of God. The actual final revelation of the word of God is the word become flesh, Jesus. And this is meant to point us to Jesus. But there's, like, two different covenants in here. There's actually more than that. But for our purposes, there's two big ones. And one that's the first two-thirds of the, of the Bible, like, that was between God and a particular nation at a particular time. That's not your covenant. But the second is between God through Jesus, and it's for all people at all times. That's your covenant. You should probably start with that second one. And when you do dive into the old, we read it through the lens and the filter of the new and understand, oh, this is, this is about Jesus. This was meant to get us to Jesus, and now we're living in the, in the reality and the life of the new covenant. And there's a place for the old. Like, this isn't just, hey, we should never study the Old Testament and we should never look at the old covenant. That would be a mistake. But the old, its backstory, its context, it informs us of how we got to where we are. It, it fills out and rounds out some of the edges and gives us a more full picture of, of Jesus. It provides examples and illustrations, but it is not binding on us. That is, it is not the thing that when I say, how do I relate to the world? How do I relate to God? What do I build my life on? It's Jesus and the covenant that he has established. And when we do that, the old actually comes to life in a brand new way. We're going to pick up this conversation next week as we wrap up this series, but I would love to, to just pray for us. God, we thank you. Um, man, we thank you that you have invited us into relationship, that you, you, have, you have established this new covenant, Jesus, the covenant that has been established in your blood that your, your love displayed on the cross, your blood poured out, Jesus, your life, your death, your resurrection has welcomed us into this brand new thing. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the promise of this covenant, of, of, being enter, like, of entering into your kingdom and being your kingdom people. And the promise of your Holy Spirit, your indwelling presence to live within us. My prayer is for those of us that are, are your followers, that we call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, that, that through the power of your spirit, you would enable us and empower us to live out just kind of new covenant lives every single day. 
as people of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.